David Lynch claims that his film is easy to understand, but most of its viewers have disagreed. In an interview, he was asked to explain this difference and responded by comparing film, not just his film, but all film, both to music and to dreams. Music, he says, is just an experience. It is very far away from words, and there's not an intellectual thing going on. Film, quote, has those same elements of just experience, but whether because of the words spoken by the characters or some other feature that distinguishes it from music, people falsely believe that their experience of a film can be translated into words. Similarly with dreams. You tell your friend a dream, Lynch says, and you can see in the face they don't understand. This is what happens to Dan, who has asked someone to come to Winkies in order to tell him a recurring nightmare he has had about it. We never learn this man's identity. He could be merely a friend, but let's infer that he's a therapist. He seems to play that kind of role. Even before Dan begins, the look of contempt on the therapist's face anticipates this gap between dream and word. Dan tries to speak, but the failure of his words to communicate his inner feeling is most evident in his effort to describe the ambient time of the dream. It's not day or night, it's kind of half night, you know? But the therapist does not know, nor do we, if we understand knowledge the way philosophers generally do. Yet an alternate mode of knowledge is possible, according to Lynch. Use your intuition and then an understanding comes inside of you. He said that in an interview speaking about Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive, he said, is not that difficult to understand if you trust your inner feeling. This essay tries to be faithful to that recommendation, recognizing all the while that it is bound to fail, like every argument whose medium is words, by articulating the notion of intuition and the vague injunction to trust your feeling. After all, this film evokes many different feelings, and it is by no means clear which we should trust. So although our ultimate goal is to understand it, or at least understand it better, an intermediate goal of this essay is to sketch an alternate mode of knowledge, an alternate epistemology, if you will, that will help us to understand this film. First, though, we should say a word about monsters. Ancient Greek philosophers made important uses of them. Aristotle, for example, considered a monster to be a perversion of the natural order. Before him, Plato thought of monsters as hybrids of conflicting parts. Despite the differences between these two notions of monstrosity, they are similar inasmuch as each sees the monster as a threat to philosophical categories, a disruption of rational thought and stable being by the world's irrational becoming. According to the seminal work of recent teratology, that's the study of monsters, according to this work, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's monster theory, these are some of the principal characteristics of a monster, disruption of philosophical categories, stable being, being disrupted especially by irrational becoming. By most of the other characteristics Cohen enumerates as well, Mulholland Drive and its main characters are monsters. Its deepest lesson, this essay argues, is that we are too. So that's the introduction, and now we're into the second section uh, on your handout. The film itself is a hybrid of a rejected television pilot and a cinematic coda. Lynch called the pilot a body without a head. It would have died, he says in an interview, if he had not found a head to bring it to life. Born from chance, as well as from an imagination worthy of Dr. Frankenstein, it was nourished by both as it matured. The result is a film that the director, so usually reticent about the interpretation of his films, and so careful that their DVDs not be divided into chapters, which is very frustrating if you're studying them because you, you can't skip to where you need to go. At any rate, the result is that he nonetheless divides this film into three acts. He does not say when each begins or ends, however, so the following divisions I'm making are purely speculative. The first act emerged from the pilot, whose footage was re-edited once it was incorporated into the feature-length film. That, that's something he says. According, so in other words, it's not as if we have the pilot and then he just tacks something on at the end. He re-edited that first, uh, I say, two-thirds. Accordingly, we need a name for it that avoids any reference to its genesis. We shall henceforth call it the night act the time of dreams. It stretches from the beginning of the film to the scene where Betty and Rita stand before the bathroom mirror in Aunt Ruth's apartment after they have cut Rita's hair and given her a blonde wig. The second act stretches from the next scene when Betty and Rita make love to the moment when the cowboy summons Diane Selwyn to wake up. 
We shall call this the half-night act, the twilight of dawn or dusk, midway between dream and reality. The third and final act, I'm going to call it the day act, stretches from her waking to the end of the film. To orient ourselves within this bewildering narrative, this tripartite structure will help, but we should also recount the relevant details of each act. We begin in this recounting as the film does with the night. Of its many narrative threads, foremost is the search for the real identity of Rita. Victim of a hit that was interrupted by a car accident, she flees both its horror and the shadowy syndicate of executives and hitmen who pursue her. Descending from the Hollywood Hills and crossing Sunset Boulevard, which is Lynch's favorite film, she finds a refuge in an unlocked Havenhurst apartment. It belongs to Ruth, an old actress who has just left for a shoot in Canada, but is soon occupied by her niece, Betty. Giddy with excitement, I just came here from Deep River, Ontario, and now I am in this dream place. Betty surveys the apartment, beholds herself in a mirror, and then notices Rita showering. Suffering severe amnesia from the car accident, she cannot recall her own name. So when Betty asks her nervously after it, Rita responds by looking to a movie poster hanging next to the shower. The movie is Gilda, starring Rita Hayworth. More precisely, she sees this poster reflected in one mirror, just as we see her reflected in another. Appearing as reflections of separate characters then, Rita and Betty begin a film noir search for her real identity. This search will fail, eventually dissolving the distinction between them, not to mention the distinction between reality and its reflected appearances. They begin with two facts and two memories. The facts. Rita's purse is stuffed with money, as well as a shiny blue key. The memories. First the accident's location, Mulholland Drive, then the name of the waitress who happens to serve them at Winkies, Diane, which soon evokes Diane Selwyn. Equipped with this name and a phone book, their search brings them to the Sierra Bonita apartments. Diane Selwyn no longer lives in the one listed, but the anonymous woman who answers its door has switched apartments with her. A ringing phone distracts her before she can take them to the other apartment. Without a key but under the spell of movie fantasies, Betty cajoles Rita into helping her break in. The technicolor landscape of Hollywood now gives way to a fetid darkness that hides a female corpse. Fleeing in terror the sight of its gray, bloody, and bloated face, their beautiful faces freeze, stagger, and overlap as though the film projector were jammed. The dramatic illusion sustained tenuously throughout the night act thus begins to break down. Indeed, the sharp distinction between its two main characters, Betty the perky blonde ingenue, Rita the sad brunette femme fatale, begins rapidly to dissolve. Back safely at Havenhurst, Betty helps Rita cut her dark hair and cover what remains with a blonde wig. There's a long story I can tell in the question period about he does that. It's, it's a Godard film that he's referring to. The night act ends here with the two blondes standing side by side before the same bathroom mirror that first showed us Rita adopting her name. The second act, shot in twilight, opens with their love scene. A tentative goodnight kiss turns passionate, melting the inhibitions that separate their bodies. The consummation is brief, and although we do not see it, we ride on the waves of a musical crescendo worthy of Wagner. The silence of their postcoital sleep is soon interrupted by Rita speaking from the depths of a dream. Silencio, she intones, adding two other Spanish phrases. No hay banda, there is no band, and no hay orquesta, there is no orchestra. Waking and obviously afraid, she insists they go to Club Silencio, where these phrases will be repeated along with others that clarify the lesson. This is all a tape recording, says the magician, who rattles Betty with thunder and flashes of lightning. And yet we hear a band. Before disappearing in a billow of smoke, he declares, it is all an illusion. This intellectual comment on the whole film, we, the audience, also hear a band, so to speak, because we see substantial people on these screens, but they're just flickering images projected through celluloid. It's succeeded by its most emotional scene, La La Rona de Los Angeles. While singing crying in Spanish and overwhelming Betty and Rita with grief, she collapses, apparently dead. The MC carries her off stage, but her song goes on. It was all a recording. Reaching into her purse for tissues, Betty finds a shiny blue box. She and Rita return in haste to Havenhurst to open it with the key hidden there. When Betty disappears, however, and Rita is left alone to ask, 
¿Dónde estás? ¿Dónde estás? Where are you? She opens the box by herself. Looking inside, the camera now adopts her perspective, Rita's perspective. She descends into its darkness and likewise disappears. The dream is over. The day-night act concludes with a summons to wake issued by the cowboy. Although he appears in all three acts and is the only character to do so, he features in the night's second most important narrative thread, which follows the travails of Adam Kesher, director of the Sylvia North story. After Adam rejects the command of the shadowy syndicate to cast Camilla Rhodes as the lead in his movie, he finds himself bankrupt, ousted from his film, and in a corral beneath a flickering light to meet this cowboy. It's my favorite scene. Many, many agree. There's sometimes a buggy, the cowboy informs Adam, teaching him that his ride as a director requires someone else to be the real driver. Now, you will see me one more time if you do good, he advises before leaving, but two more times if you do bad. Similarly, at the end of the day-night act, as though speaking again on behalf of some omnipotent reality, he addresses a Betty sleeping in the same fetal posture as the Sierra Bonita corpse. Hey, pretty girl, he says with an uncharacteristic smile, time to wake up. A second shot of her body shows it as the corpse, and the cowboy leaves. Someone then wakes up, thereby beginning the day act. But it is Diane rather than Betty. Both are played by Naomi Watts, however, and this link creates the temptation to interpret the first two acts as Diane's dream, the ensuing act as her reality. If any scene were to epitomize this reality, it would be her own account of herself at the posh dinner party off Mulholland Drive, where Adam will apparently announce his engagement to Camilla. After an ironic drum roll from the soundtrack, Diane tells her story to Adam's mother, who seems anxious and bored. I always wanted to come here, she begins. Back home in Deep River, Ontario, she won a jitterbug contest, and that's that first scene of the jitterbug, which just seems like a gratuitous opening, but it seems to be a reference to this origin. That sort of led to acting, she says, although immediately she feels the need to clarify, you know, wanting to act, because she hasn't become an actress, she's failed. Her aunt was a movie actress who died and left her some money, making it possible for her to come to Hollywood. On the set of the Sylvia North story, according to her story, she met Camilla, who beat her to the lead she wanted so badly. Camilla was great in that, says an anonymous man sitting next to her. With a hint of resentment and an awkward pause, Diane replies, yeah. Looking fondly toward Camilla, who is seated at the head table next to Adam and speaking Spanish, she resumes. Camilla has since become a star, but nonetheless secures small parts in her films for Diane. Hearing this detail, Adam's mother finally shows Diane some sympathy, patting her hand and saying, I see. This gesture seems to make Diane feel ashamed. Looking again toward the head table, this time seeing the host couple laughing together and leaning on one another, her vision blurs, and now the camera adopts her perspective. It then refocuses as she stares into her coffee cup. If we credit other scenes in the day act, scenes of frustrated sex and an acrimonious breakup, Diane and Camilla have also been lovers. Toward the end of this dinner party, she sees Camilla flirt openly with another woman. Thus, defeated, jilted, and tormented by her beloved, apparently, Diane becomes a monster of grief and jealous rage. The sound of shattering dishes links the end of this dinner party scene with the beginning of the next in Winkies, where Diane meets a hitman, Joe. All three are shabby counterparts to the glamour of the dinner party. Their anxious conversation is interrupted first by the dishes and then by the arrival of their perky waitress, Betty. Now remember that Naomi Watts plays not just this Diane, but also Betty in the dream. Betty, who apologizes, pours coffee and leaves them alone again. Diane offers Joe a purse with money and a photo resume of Camilla. You sure you want this, he asks. She says, more than anything in this world. He promises to signal success with the discreet placement of a blue key. Fixing her eyes with his own, he says, you'll find this where I told you. Distracted for a moment by the glance of a customer waiting to settle his bill at the register, which comes in the night act as that dream that Dan is sharing with his therapist, he resembles exactly the night act's Dan. Okay, she returns Joe's gaze, that is this hitman, and asks him, what's it open, this key? He answers only with sinister laughter fading into a dark vision of the vagrant in the alley behind the diner. Smoke billows behind him as he turns over in his filthy hands a shiny blue box. 
He places it in a crumpled paper bag and drops it to the ground. All pretense of reality is abandoned when miniature figures dance out of the bag, laughing maniacally. They seem to be the same couple who accompanied Betty upon her dreamy arrival at LAX, the Los Angeles airport. As though briefly returning to reality, the next scene shows Diane back in her Sierra Bonita apartment, where she contemplates the blue key on her coffee table. Panning across it and another cup of coffee, we watch her descend into madness. Knocks on her front door herald the miniature couple, who crawl under it, now grown to full size, as though psychopomps leading her out of the dream place into which they originally accompanied Betty, they pursue her with the same maniacal laughter and fingers outstretched like claws. Running into her bedroom, she collapses onto her bed, reaches for the revolver in the nightstand, and kills herself. Okay, so that's my account of uh, the narrative, um, whose elements I'm now going to use to develop what I'm calling a platonic interpretation. With this articulation of the film into three acts and the relevant details of uh, its narrative and characters before us, we may indulge for a while a popular interpretation of it that relies on a sharp distinction between appearance and reality, not to mention its cognate distinctions between the images of reflection, dreaming, fantasy, and hallucination on the one hand, and the world outside our imagination on the other. This popular interpretation, now I say popular, but if you go to the websites about Mulholland Drive, this is the one that circulates the most, and, and some uh, scholars on this film endorse this interpretation as well. This popular interpretation, which we shall call platonic, because of its distinction between appearance and reality, will motivate our exploration of the epistemological assumptions we bring to the film, so that once we have distilled the lessons of that philosophical exploration, we may return to the film and offer a better interpretation of it one based on an epistemology closer to the one Lynch expresses in his interviews. Briefly, according to this platonic interpretation, the day act recounts Diane's failure and fury in Hollywood, and this is the dark, banal, and unifying reality behind the colorful, adventurous, and disjointed appearances of her dream, which occupy the first two-thirds of the film. Although easily stated in brief, this tempting interpretation is much harder to develop in detail. Ultimately, in fact, it proves impossible. In its crudest form, this interpretation assumes a one-to-one -one correspondence between characters and the two segments of the film. While the day act gives us real life, according to it, the other acts reflect this reality with dreamy enhancements. The day act shows us Diane in a dingy white bathrobe, for example, whereas the night act's Betty wears a similar one enhanced with bright pink. Although this transposition works to some extent between the Naomi Watts characters, which makes it so tempting a hermeneutic key to unlock the whole film's blue box. It fails to explain the complex associations between other characters. Both Rita and Camilla, for instance, are played by Laura Elena Har Haring. So you think there's a symmetry. You've got Naomi Watts playing Diane and Betty, and you've got Laura Elena Haring playing Rita and Camilla. But the correspondence between those two characters is much looser. In the night act, Rita rides alone in the limousine that makes a surprise stop on Mulholland Drive. That's the first major scene of the movie. But in the day act, it's Diane who's doing this, not Camilla. If there has been any transposition from reality to dream in this case, then, the real Diane has reflected herself as Rita as well as Betty. Were this not problematic enough, moreover, far more complex associations hold between the minor characters, not to mention between inanimate objects and other aspects of the dream. And I had originally a very long footnote about all the minor characters and suitcases, coffee cups, lampshades, and so on. We can talk about those in the question period if you'd like. If it is to be at all plausible, therefore, this platonic interpretation must permit a fluid relationship between elements of reality and dreams. Such fluidity can be granted faithfully by recalling Lynch's own comparison between films and dreams, as well as this film's particular discussion of dreams, the one with which we began. Dan dreams of a terrifying monster behind Winkies. Unfortunately for him, his therapist's contempt for dreams is matched by the naivety of his technique for dealing with them. He tries to pierce Dan's fear by confronting him with its object, with predictably disastrous results. This seems to be cognitive behavioral therapy, as far as I can tell. <laughs> for if Freud is right, Dreaming is a compromise between the forbidden latent content of our minds and an unconscious agency that protects us from its threat by converting it into the tolerable manifest content we experience as the dream. The manifest content thus appears on the surface of the dreamer's mind, while the latent content is a psychic reality below that includes short-term memories from the day before, Freud calls that the day residue, 
long-term memories from as distant as one's earliest childhood, and all the emotions associated with both. The conversion of this latent reality into manifest appearance is far from random, however, because it must satisfy two opposed demands. On one hand, the demand to satisfy the forbidden wishes embedded in the latent content. On the other, the demand to avoid the fear and anxiety that would attend the satisfaction of these wishes in their raw form. So the famous example is the edible desires, and those, those make the dreamer too anxious, and so the fantasy of the mother gets transferred onto another woman or onto anything else for that matter. This process of conversion, which Freud calls the dream work, uses specific techniques, each analogous to a poetic device. Displacement, that's Freud's technical term, at least as it's translated. Displacement is just metonymy in uh, literature, transposing one element from the latent content into another in the manifest. Fragmentation and condensation, again Freud's terms, these are merely two modes of ambiguity, the literary term. The first, fragmentation, dissolves one element into many. The second, condensation, fuses multiple elements into one. Substitution of an element's part for its whole is but synecdoche, while exaggeration or diminution of an element are hyperbole and irony, respectively. So all I'm claiming in this paragraph is that Freud has these techniques for how latent content gets converted into manifest content, and they're just literary techniques. The, possibility are, the possibilities are nearly endless, restricted by the urgent need to compromise between the mind's opposed demands of unconscious wish and fear, but in no way restricted by its conscious principles of reason. This is Freud. Ideas which are contraries are by preference expressed in dreams by one and the same element. So two contrary ideas which are irreconcilable according to logic are expressed in a dream according to Freud by one element, thereby flouting the principle of non-contradiction. The principle of sufficient reason fares no better. Freud again, a causal relation between two thoughts is either left unrepresented or is replaced by a sequence of two pieces of different lengths, although the representation is often reversed, so effect can come before cause. Dream logic, if it may be called that, is the illogic then of poetry. This is not to say it is random notice, but only that each association will require its own analysis if we are to understand it, sometimes using one poetic technique, other times using another, but always seeking the same compromise sought by the mind itself between wish and fear. Were the final act of Mulholland Drive Diane's reality and the earlier acts her dream, it would come as no surprise that the association between the elements in the two segments is illogical. Were the life of Diane in the day act to supply the latent content that is manifest in the earlier acts, it should come as no surprise to find there a colorful appearance in which she is displaced onto another character fragmented into several characters, or fused with someone else into one character. And so likewise for the people she meets, especially those about whom she feels strongly, and above all those whom she loves. The transposition from reality to dream does not follow philosophical logic, where contradiction is impossible and effect must follow cause, future, or the past, but it does heed the illogic of fantasy, where time and causality are suspended, and something can both be and not be itself as well as something else. So this would be an explanation of why the first two-thirds of the movie are so confusing. What we're getting there is a dream with all of its logic. Dream characters are thus hybrids, or as Freud calls them, composite structures, which are creations, and this is a quote, not unlike the composite animals invented by the folk imagination. These folk monsters, he says, have already assumed stereotypes in our thought, whereas in dreams, Fresh composite forms are being perpetually constructed in an, in, in, in an inexhaustible variety. So every night we create a fresh new monsters. That said, dream monsters are of two basic types, good and bad. When the dream work succeeds, its monstrous creations satisfy the dreamer's wishes without provoking her fears. These are the good monsters, and she sleeps on. When the dream work fails, however, its creations become too scary. They are the bad ones, and she awakes. Freud compares this difference to the two options available to a night watchman, quote, who first carries out his duty by suppressing disturbances so that the townsman may not be woken up, but afterwards continues to do his duty by himself waking the townsman up if the causes of the disturbance seem to him serious and of a kind that he cannot cope with alone. So if Diane is the dreamer, her dream work successfully suppresses disturbances that manifest as variously as car accidents and murder. She orchestrates, it's, it's comic sometimes too, I think those two hitmen, for example. I've watched the movie ten times and I laugh more every time uh, with that scene. 
She orchestrates all of these monsters into a vibrant and occasionally comic production. But it finally fails when it projects a corpse that shocks by both its rot and its resemblance to herself. And of course, Freud talks about the uncanny and what's especially disturbing is if something is too much like us. With the interruption of her dream work, her projector jams, and the multifarious characters of its creation begin to resolve themselves into one groggy consciousness. It is only a matter of time, the duration of the day-night act, as it turns out, before her night watchman, the cowboy, arrives to issue the inevitable order, time to wake up, pretty girl. But is Diane the dreamer? To answer this question, and thereby underwrite the platonic interpretation, we have now buttressed with Freud Freudian dream theory, we would have first to determine who she really is. That determination proves impossible, however, because it requires us to credit the day act as reality. Hallucination of the miniature old couple makes it incredible. So too does the kiss of the two Camillas at the dinner party that enrages Diane. In this modern setting, the blonde Camilla wears her 50s period costume from the set of the Sylvia North story. Moreover, when she exits the room, she passes the cowboy who exits the party. What is a cowboy doing at a gathering of Hollywood glitterati? These are not the only inconsistencies in the narrative of the day act. In the scene on the set of Adam's movie, for example, Diane seethes with jealousy as she watches Camilla being kissed by him, by Adam Kesher, the director. But in the dinner party scene, when she recounts how she met Camilla on the set of this very movie, the anonymous man beside her asks whether its director, the director of the Sylvia North story, was Bob Brooker, and she agrees. Or, while Diane stands alone in her drab kitchen, unwashed in her dirty bathrobe, Camilla appears perfectly made up in her signature red. With tears of desperate joy, Diane exclaims, you've come back. Immediately, though, her tears turn to sobs that rattle her as she contemplates nothing. Nothing, that is, but herself. For the next shot shows her standing where Camilla appeared to be. Only contempt now detectable on her face. So which part of the scene was memory, which part fantasy, and which part hallucination? Once we lose this faith in the reality of this act, and really this faith cannot be reasonably maintained in the face of so many contradictions, it becomes impossible finally to assess the reality of any of its particular scenes. Does Diane have sex with Camilla? Did they ever? Do they ever break up? Were they ever together? Is there anyone really named Camilla? Most radically, and this is the question to which I'll return after the philosophical exploration, does Diane even exist? This is a peculiar question whose significance may not even be clear. To answer it, therefore, we now begin a philosophical excursus that aims to provide the background necessary to make its significance clearer. This excursus begins with Plato, then juxtaposes his views with the rival views of Nietzsche. Only after the contours of this background have been painted in broad strokes can we highlight the precise features of our own interpretation of Lynch's film. To anticipate our conclusion, Diane does not exist. Properly understood, however, neither do we. So this is the section on Plato now. At the center of Republic, Plato's Socrates distinguishes sharply between knowledge and other cognitive powers. Although many have since rejected details of his distinction, especially the rich ontology he associates with it, most presume its basic tenet, that knowledge requires consistency. Separate powers must deal with separate things, he says, and so for each cognitive power, he identifies a different object. Knowledge is infallible, dealing only with what is. Ignorance, that is deep, deep ignorance, is always wrong, dealing only with what is not. In between these two opposed powers is a third, the fallible power of belief, sometimes right and sometimes wrong. The object with which it deals must likewise lie between the other two. By shortening what is to being and what is not to non-being, he identifies the object of belief as what partakes in both being and not being, in other words, a contradiction. This contradictory hybrid he elsewhere calls becoming, the world of change we are all born crediting through our senses. Children do not exhibit the critical reason necessary to eliminate contradiction and think consistently of pure being, nor do many grow out of this sensual gullibility, according to Plato. Becoming thus remains the basis of, quote, the majority of people's conventional views. But a proper education, culminating in philosophy, which alone pierces hybrid appearances through pure reason, this philosophical education can free us from the seductive power of becoming. 
The image that illustrates this pedagogy is Plato's most famous, the cave. Quote, compare the effect of education and that of the lack of it on our nature, he begins, to an experience like this. So he's talking about education, above all. The cave is so famous an image that we rarely consider how scary it is. Hearing it from Socrates for the first time, Plato's brother reminds us that it is a strange image you are describing and strange prisoners. He seems spooked by it. As much for us as for the Greeks, who knew caves as the mythical homes of the Cyclopes, they were the locus of monsters. Plato makes monstrosity more explicit at the summit of his argument when he illustrates his psychology by comparing the soul to Chimaira, Scylla, Kerberos, and the numerous other cases where many different kinds are said to have grown together into one. The bodily appetites are collectively like a many-headed beast with a ring of tame and savage animal heads that can grow and change at will. Already, therefore, this first part of the soul is a monster, the appetite. It fuses many heads of many different types, which change or become through time according to the becoming world reported to them by the senses. Next in the soul are the emotions, or at least the emotion of anger, which Socrates compares to a lion as well as a snake. This second part is thus also a hybrid on its own, beholden likewise to the senses and becoming, though corrected by a third part that does not change because it heeds eternal being. Reason, this third part, Plato symbolizes with a homunculus. Join the three into one, that is the homunculus, the hydra, and the lion snake, so that they somehow grow together naturally. So we're imagining a beast here of, of uh, strange varieties. And we have an image of our monstrous humanity, according to Plato. The uniform appearance of our skin hides from view the reality of our multiform soul. Jean-Joseph Gou has shown how Plato built this model of the soul from the materials of Greek mythology. Ancient heroes typically had to earn their status by a journey consummated with the violent killing of a monster. Bellerophon stabbed Chimaira with a lance, Perseus decap decapitated Medusa with a dagger, and Jason slew from within the dragon that had swallowed him whole. This monomyth, Gou argues, depicts an initiation into maturity through which a youth must leave his home and its jealous king survive fearsome adversity that culminates in the slaying of a monster, and thereby earn a bride of his own elsewhere. The notable exception to this pattern was Sophocles' Oedipus. He defeated his monster, the Sphinx, not with a violent deed, but with a clever word, human. For this innovation, he won not another man's daughter, but his own father's wife, in other words, his mother. In Gu's persuasive interpretation of this perversion of the heroic monomyth, Sophocles dramatizes the cost of the Greek Enlightenment he, that he witnessed throughout his life. By trading violent deeds for clever words, the youth never really matures. To marry, this immature man must therefore kill his father because he has never left home. So-called Oedipal desires are therefore the price to be paid for enlightenment, Greek or otherwise. Plato takes the next step, according to Gu, putting these new monsters in the soul. Its irrational parts, hydra and lion snake, shrink from nothing, neither incest nor parasite, according to Plato himself. By contrast, the rational part, our inner homunculus, seeks only eternal truth and above all the good. With this image of the soul, Plato is not thereby condemning us to monstrosity any more than his cave allegory condemns us to imprisonment. In both cases, he admonishes with hope. Perhaps we will be frightened by these images, if not persuaded by the arguments they illustrate, and will then try to resist the temptations presented by the inferior parts of our soul, purge from ourselves the results of their attraction to the appearances of hybrid becoming, and identify finally with pure reason, which is our true nature. That's Plato's hope. This is the promise of his philosophy, an education to help us become who we really are. Maturity, as Plato understands it, defeats monstrosity. Although most philosophers nowadays reject Platonism, and nearly all would blanch at its invocation of monsters, many nonetheless agree with two of its basic tenets. Not only that knowledge requires consistency, but also that maturity requires knowledge. Mulholland Drive challenges this consensus, not with consistent arguments, which would weaken its challenge by hypocrisy, but instead with the sensual images of tragedy, which Plato himself feared as monstrous. Like all the arts, according to him, tragedy is imitative. Like painting in particular, it imitates appearances rather than reality, and not just any appearances. The ways of, as he says, a wise and self-same character, someone whose soul is ruled by reason, 
or the homunculus within, this wise person, these ways are neither easy to imitate nor easy to understand when imitated. So no one makes tragedies about wise people. To most people, the tale of such a character would be boring. With its passionate tales of violence and perversion, by contrast, tragedy imitates the ways of people whose souls are ruled by irrationality, the part that leads us to recollections of our suffering and to lamentations, and is insatiable for these things. Such tales appeal to most people whose souls are likewise irrational. Tragedy thus excites the childish passion, passions that the masses have by appealing to the monsters that rule their souls. In short, tragedy presents monstrous characters on stage to please the monstrous parts in the audience. But furthermore, tragedy itself is a monster because it represents the scariest monster of all. By recalling his chief epistemological distinction between knowledge, ignorance, and belief, Plato diagnoses the imaginative artist's error as its neglect, that is the neglect of this distinction. Whatever the subject matter, be it shoes, military strategy, or the best way of life, only a fool fails to distinguish between knowledge, ignorance, and imitation. That's Plato. The imitator of human life and character, the tragedian, errs in his making of images because whatever appears good to the masses who know nothing, that, it seems, is what he will imitate. Relying in this way on appearances, and especially the unreliable appearances of the ignorant masses, the maker of an image, the imitator, knows nothing we say about what is or being. The power of the artist's imagination is not set over what is or being, but instead over what is and what is not, being and not being. In other words, his art represents the contradictory hybrid of becoming. Whether or not Plato was right to fear it as such, tragedy and its modern offspring, cinema, is indeed a hybrid, for this was acknowledged and even celebrated by its foremost advocate, Nietzsche. So now the Nietzsche section, number five on your handout. No less than Plato, Nietzsche begins to understand tragedy by using the distinction between appearance and reality. According to Plato, tragedy presents an appearance of an appearance because it draws its material from the senses which already report appearances of true reality, the forms. With this much, Nietzsche agrees, in Birth of Tragedy, that is. But because his conception of reality inverts Plato's, so too does his evaluation of tragedy's doubled appearance. Platonic reality, on one hand, is pure being, free of contradiction, redeeming whoever identifies with reason and thinks of it alone. Nietzschean reality, on the other hand, is impure becoming, an eternal contradiction, annihilating whoever is so unfortunate as to behold it naked of all adornment. There are several Greek myths about poor humans who behold a god without adequate preparation. Semele wishes to see her lover, Zeus, in the light of day, and is destroyed by the overwhelming sight. Actaeon stumbles upon the chaste huntress god, Diana, while she is bathing in the company of her nymphs. He is then devoured by his own hounds. In this mythic tradition, Nietzsche describes the tremendous horror which grips man when he suddenly loses his way among the cognitive forms of the phenomenal world, as the principle of reason in any of its forms appears to break down. The pure being of Plato's cognition, his path to maturity, is in fact a fantasy, according to Nietzsche, one way to cope with an otherwise overwhelming chaos. Reason is reality's clothing, in other words, without which we would all look upon it naked and suffer the fate of Actium. One form of the principle of reason is that every effect must have a cause. That's the principle of sufficient reason I mentioned earlier. Another is that being precludes not being, the principle of non-contradiction. Not coincidentally, both principles receive their first articulation in the poem of Parmenides, whose goddess uses them to lead her initiate onto the sure path of reason and reality, away from the contradictory path of belief. Those who travel the latter, that is the contradictory uh, way of belief, she calls them two-headed, like monsters. Quote, for whom both to be and not to be are judged the same and not the same, and the path of all is backward turning, and the Greek word is palindropos. These mortals wander through a twilight where, as she says, all is full of light and obscure night together. So if you travel the road of belief as opposed to knowledge, you're going to be in this twilight where light and night are indistinguishable. By contrast, should her initiate think only of what is, of being, he will mature into the recognition of his own undying being. If Plato was the best evangelist of this cult of consistency, Nietzsche has been its best, though hardly its only apostate. Before Parmenides founded it, Heraclitus bemoaned that people do not understand how 
Though in conflict with itself, it agrees with itself. Whether speaking of the whole world or the human instruments that illustrate his cosmology, Heraclitus wrote, it is a backward turning or polyntropos harmony, like that of the bow and the lyre. He seems to be speaking about the whole world as a, as a backward turning harmony. Conflict, according to him, is the father of all things. This father is an, um, is an omnipotent Zeus, playing with the cosmos as his delightful game, but also an omnipotent, uh, excuse me, an omnipresent contradiction. He, Heraclitus says, holes and not holes, convergent, divergent, consonant, dissonant, from all things one and from one all things. Uh, his best aphorism celebrating contradiction. Seeking precedence for his apostasy from the cult of consistency, Nietzsche invokes Heraclitus, here in The Birth of Tragedy as elsewhere, by likewise calling contradiction the father of all things. The truth of the world, he believes, is found not through consistent thought, but in the transports of Dionysian revelry. Not through order, that is, but in disorder. The quotation, excess revealed itself as the truth, and the contradiction, the bliss born of pain, spoke out from the heart of nature. Were we somehow able to survive such pain, which in its rawest form destroys the individual, we would be compelled to accept the so-called wisdom of Silenus, that it is best of all never to have been born, and next best to die as soon as possible. But the Greeks, who knew this pain and had this as an ideal of wisdom, they nonetheless enjoyed their lives, so that even their greatest hero preferred to see serve a landless man rather than become king over all the breathless dead. So this is a mystery to Nietzsche. They confronted this reality head on, and yet somehow they enjoyed their lives. How did they do it? And tragedy is his answer. How did they remain aware of the horror of existence without being destroyed by this awareness? Tragedy interposed between the reality and them a screen of beauty, rendering their life not just tolerable, but pleasurable. They were redeemed, in other words, by dreaming, by an aesthetic phenomenon, by the appearance of an appearance. As such, however, tragedy was a hybrid of two opposed elements, which Nietzsche names after the divinities he imagines as patrons of each. The reality of becoming he attributes to Dionysus, while to Apollo he attributes the appearance of being. Recalling that Aeschylean tragedy was originally as musical as Wagnerian opera, he assigns music to Dionysus because it conveys directly the irrational pulse of the world and our unconscious will, whereas to Apollo he assigns the libretto with its individual characters and the conscious thoughts they evince through words. So it's the same distinction Lynch was making in his interview between the unconscious music and the conscious words and reason. Although musical tragedy itself admittedly includes the word, writes Nietzsche, anticipating Lynch in his interview, it can still at the same time juxtapose the underworld and the birthplace of the word and clarify its development for us from the inside. That's again from The Birth of Tragedy. Neither one without the other would work <clears throat> for tragedy. Words without music would remain lifeless abstractions, disconnected from the reality of becoming. Music without words would immerse us in the flow, but deny us the illusion of being afforded by our cognition, which he thinks we need in order to survive the horror that we would recognize otherwise. Thought and word, Nietzsche writes, rescue us from the unbridled outpouring of the unconscious will. Fused together into the hybrid of tragedy, they offer modern Europeans, as much as ancient Greeks, the redemption of artistic beauty. Only as an aesthetic phenomenon, he famously writes, are existence and the world justified. Tragic justification and redemption are available to whole peoples in public spectacles, but also to the individual in the private theater of his dreaming mind. Nietzsche thus reverses Plato's directions to maturity as well as to reality. Rather than waking from our dreams, emerging from darkness into light, and piercing contradictory appearances with pure reasoning about consistent being, we should instead, according to Nietzsche, absorb the beauty of these appearances, remain in the twilight between oblivion and consciousness, and exclaim to ourselves joyously, as he did, this is a dream, I want to dream on. For dreams, like art, as he says, make life possible, worth living. With his attacks on art, dream, and the appearances of becoming, then, Plato's Socrates undermines the foundations of life, according to Nietzsche. Motivated by a metaphysical madness, he inaugurated the, quote, unshakable belief that by following the guiding thread of causality, thought reaches into the deepest abysses of being and is capable not only of knowing, but also even of correcting being. Nietzsche sees this madness corrupting attic tragedy from within, replacing the unconscious forces at work in Aeschylus with the conscious dialectics of Euripides. 
The result he contemptuously called aesthetic Socratism, the doctrine that in order to be beautiful, everything must be conscious. In Nietzschean psychology, humans are naturally driven to act and create by unconscious forces, inhibiting themselves from time to time by conscious prohibitions. Socrates, by contrast, acted and created with conscious reason, but he was inhibited occasionally by an unconscious voice, his daimonio. He thus inverted the natural order in, in himself. Instinct becomes the critic and consciousness the creator, Nietzsche concludes, so that Socrates represents in his estimation a true monstrosity per defectum. This notion of monstrosity, perversion of the natural order, stems from Aristotle, as mentioned in our introduction. As we also saw there, it differs from Plato's, that is, the monster is a hybrid of conflicting parts. Although the two often overlap in particular cases, as both privilege rational being over irrational becoming. That is, both Plato and Aristotle. If we allow that there are multiple notions of monstrosity, some applicable in some contexts, others in others, we may agree with Nietzsche that Socrates is a fearsome monster, and yet also that tragedy is a wholesome monster. We may agree, that is, unless we side with Plato, that tragedy is the most fearsome monster of all, and Socrates is its heroic slayer. Beneath this disagreement, however, is a deeper and more important agreement. Whether in Plato's attack or Nietzsche's defense, tragedy presents contradictory becoming, being and not being, appearance and reality mixed together. But whereas Nietzsche sees in this indeterminacy a beauty that could redeem us, Plato sees only a seductive monster. Lacking fangs and claws, it appeals to our native desires as children, and especially our sympathies. That is how it destroys us. Fear of the monster, observes Cohen, is really a kind of desire. Tragedy thus sings to us in our nurseries. To slay such a sweet monster, or at least resist its appeal, we must strap ourselves to the mast of philosophy. That's Plato. Plato's Socrates teaches us how, distinguishing appearance from reality and exposing contradictions with consistent reason, philosophers nowadays eschew myth more fastidiously than did Plato. Oh, excuse me, I just ran together two sentences. I'll just start. Philosophers nowadays eschew myth more fastidiously than did Plato, but they share this formula, that is, that we need to distinguish appearance from reality and we need to think consistently. When they acknowledge any provenance for it, Aristotle is most often the father, codifying reason's foremost principle, it is impossible for the same thing, both to belong and not to belong, at the same time, to the same thing, and in the same respect. That's his principle of non-contradiction. Anyone who mistakenly believes that it is possible to do that, according to him, does not engage in rational discourse. In short, as Aristotle puts it, if you don't buy the principle of non-contradiction, he is like a plant. The injunction to accompany his prohibition of contradiction is thus clear enough. Reason consistently as a mature human being or regress to the irrational immaturity of a quasi-human vegetable. Which returns us finally to David Lynch. As though he were a plant and Mulholland drive his impossible discourse, Lynch poses a fundamental challenge to this philosophical tradition by blending being and not being, appearance and reality, so thoroughly that it becomes impossible to determine which is which. This indeterminacy extends Nietzsche's earlier apostasy, surpassing a treatise about tragedy, the birth of tragedy, by not only presenting monstrosity, but arguably demonstrating its beauty. So this is now section six, the Nietzschean interpretation of the film. If any character in this film really exists, it is Diane. Who else could be the real victim of its illusions, the real dreamer of its dreams? This was the assumption of the platonic interpretation expressed before we elicited the philosophical assumptions that underwrote it. But confidence about real identity and selfhood dissolves in this film as readily as it dissolves within Nietzschean philosophy and its Freudian successor. Like Plato, first of all, Nietzsche began with a distinction between appearance and reality in The Birth of Tragedy. It's uh, ironically founded on that distinction, even though Nietzsche is famous for subverting the distinction, because he eventually did subvert it. In one of his most famous passages, uh, much later in Twilight of the Idols, the passage is called How the Real World Finally Became a Fable. He recounts six stages between Plato's version of that distinction and his own philosophical revolution. And this is it. The real world, we have done away with it. What world was left? The apparent one, perhaps? But no, with the real world, we have also done away with the apparent one. Like Plato, secondly, Freud famously analyzed the soul into parts, the closest one to a self being das Ich, once commonly translated as the ego, 
but more accurately nowadays as the I, or the self. Whereas the rational self of Platonic psychology was stable, indeed necessary, and eternal, every part of the Freudian soul is supposed to be the product of time and contingency. The Freudian self, in other words, is produced by ever-changing bodily drives, shifting alliances in confrontation with each other and a frustrating world. Although Freud's systematic tendencies reduced these drives to two, sex and death, he was thereby extending a psychology adopted by Nietzsche from Schopenhauer. While proudly stressing that he read neither, Freud acknowledges the large extent to which psychoanalysis coincides with the philosophy of Schopenhauer, before describing Nietzsche as another philosopher whose guesses and intuitions often agree in the most astonishing way with the laborious findings of psychoanalysis. So Schopenhauer and Nietzsche just made good guesses, and Freud did the laborious work to show that it was right. With one short and very intuitive chapter, in fact, Nietzsche anticipates the main notions of Freudian dream theory not to mention psychoanalytic psychology more generally. This is from Daybreak. Every moment of our lives sees some of the polyp arms of our being grow and others of them wither. So we've got these drives from our body. They're like polyp arms, and they're growing, and they're withering, constantly changing. <clears throat> he seems to be evoking Plato's image of the hydra's many heads. All according to the nutriment which the moment does or does not bear with it. The polyp arms of our being are our drives, wishes, or appetites, it seems. The nutriment they seek is occasionally available in our encounters with reality, but more often our souls supply it through imagination. This is especially true of dreams, according to Nietzsche, because the meaning and value of dreams is precisely to compensate to some extent for the chance absence of nourishment during the day. But it is no less true of waking life when our desires are just as urgent. Quote, waking life does not have this freedom of interpretation possessed by the life of dreams, he argues, because the screen on which it projects our daytime fantasies is never so blank as it becomes in the nighttime theater of sleep. Nevertheless, Nietzsche adds, there is no essential difference between waking and dreaming. A transference in waking life would be like the living waking dream. <clears throat> and this is precisely what we should expect from the philosopher who celebrated tragedy alongside dreams as the justification of existence. The incoherent and terrifying reality of Dionysus, or our latent content, must be transmuted for us by Apollo into manifest content if we are to tolerate it. For an individual, the technique of transmutation is dream work. For the public, tragic art. In every case, its projections are merely appearances of an appearance. But our survival requires them, or at least some of them. I must go on dreaming, Nietzsche writes elsewhere, lest I perish. Above all, we need the projection without which we literally lose our minds, the dream of a self or ego. We are none of us, Nietzsche writes, that which we appear to be in accordance with the states for which we have consciousness and words. In other words, we're not what we think we are. Because words and consciousness presents mere appearances of ineffable, unconscious depths where the rational self dissolves into the infinite drives of a mute and irrational body. The so-called ego, Nietzsche writes, is thenceforth a fellow worker in the construction of our character and destiny. So there's a body with its drives, it creates an ego, and then that ego participates in the construction of a fuller character. Just as it comes to be, however, so too can this ego or I pass away. Once we experience the dissolution of Diane into incoherent drives, projected as fantasies, always attended by passions, never fully stitched together as a coherent story. That's what I want to say is happening in the day act. It's just, it's a collection of fantasies that are showing the degeneration of a person back into those primitive drives. Then and only then do we understand the Holland drive with the intuition recommended by Lynch himself. If this intuition could be put into words, the magician at Club Silencio has already done so. It is all an illusion. But for whom? Not for Diane, because it persists after her suicide. I mean, many people who want to claim that, that she's the dreamer, if they just ignore the last three or four minutes where this seems, and yet she's hardly dead. It is not her dream, then, but ours. As the film flickers to an end, just before we, we must wake from this public dream and return to the harsh light of an indifferent world, smoke billows around her deathbed. Behind it looms one last time the face of the monstrous vagrant, whose appearance always marks a death in this film. His blackened face is now lit by flashes that recall earlier illuminations, the magician's lightning in Silencio, the lamp of the cowboy's corral, 
and the headlights on the street sign for Mulholland Drive itself. Behind the flickering images of this film, then, is a horrible reality to which we all must wake, the ultimate annihilation of self in death. This is not the reality of Plato, pure being, free of contradiction, redeeming eternally whoever identifies with it in reason and thinks of it alone. It is the reality of Nietzsche, impure becoming and eternal contradiction, destroying whoever is so unfortunate as to behold it naked. If this is indeed the nature of things, Plato's injunction to maturity, that we think consistently, strip reality of all its clothing, and grab it for ourselves, is sinister. The consummation of philosophy, which Plato imagines as making love with supreme reality after a long courtship, it's rape. That's the symposium story of the consummation of philosophy. Although his injunction presents itself as a campaign against monsters, Nietzsche unmasks it as the worst sort of monster, the murderous seducer. Of all errors thus far, he writes later, the most grievous, protracted, and dangerous has been a dogmatist's error, Plato's invention of pure spirit and of transcendental goodness. Throughout his career, he personifies this most dangerous error as Socrates, monstrous always, but especially before death. Rationality at all costs, Nietzsche writes near the end of his own career. Life bright, cold, cautious, conscious, instinct free, instinct resistant. He's imagining or describing Socrates in the Phaedo. This itself was just an illness. Lynch seems to agree, not exclusively with words in the manner of a philosopher, but by superimposing words upon images and music in the tradition of Aeschylus and Wagner and against the tradition of Plato and Parmenides he unmasks the worst sort of monster with the best. Tragic drama. And so now a quick conclusion. This is just five minutes. Dan is persuaded to confront the reality behind his fear. He collapses and we feel that within. Betty persuades Rita to seek her real identity. They find only a rotting corpse and we feel that within. The shiny blue key promises to open the shiny blue box and it does, but it terminates a beautiful dream of love and we feel that within. The sum of these and other such inner feelings evoked by Mulholland Drive is the intuitive understanding, I think, that Lynch is recommending. This is the ineffable answer to Diane's question to Joe in Winkies as he holds the blue key before her. What's it open, she asks. In necessarily hypocritical words, it opens our eyes to naked reality. It wakes us to a world indifferent to our existence. It confronts us with the rotting corpse we must all eventually become. Joe answers her more authentically without words, only sinister laughter that fades into the mortal vision behind Winkies. The tempting hermeneutic key to this film, that it presents consistent reality behind the contradictory appearances of a dream, this likewise dooms our desire to understand it. For the pernicious monster depicted in these visions is also the fantasy of real and pure identity. We cannot find any such identity because there is none such to be found. There is no being beneath our contradictory appearances. There is only the being and not being of becoming. If we wish to mature in the midst of this, to become who we are, we must try to direct this chaos. But how? This essay has considered two opposed answers to that question. The first was Plato's, enhancing Parmenides. It enjoined us to look beneath impure appearances to pure reality, and it understood maturity as moving from one to the other, as waking from a dream. The second answer to the question was Nietzsche's, and to some extent enhanced by Freud. It rejected as pernicious the fantasy of pure reality beneath impure appearances. Instead, it credited only appearances, distinguishing between those that are beautiful, creative, and vital on the one hand, and others that are ugly, destructive, and morbid on the other. This second answer understands maturity not as waking from a dream, but as beautiful dreaming, making good monsters rather than bad, by subverting the distinction between appearance and reality, and by scaring us with a monster at the terminus of the search for real identity, Mulholland Drive assumes something like this second model of maturity, the Nietzschean model. If Lynch is right, in other words, we should fear the initiation of Parmenides' goddess and avoid her straight path of pure being. We should instead go two-headed down her proscribed path of becoming, where it's kind of half-night, you know? This twilight between dreaming and waking, appearance and reality, illusion and knowledge, is where all of the characters of this film live. It is also where we moviegoers go whenever we knowingly suspend our knowledge that films are illusion. Each one is a waking dream, but few project so well as this one does a harsh reality through the screen of a beautiful appearance. 
seeming just real enough for us to suspend our disbelief, but not so real that it elicits from us real horror. Mulholland Drive manages not only to enact this contradiction, but to present it as its distinctive lesson about ourselves. We are each a dramaturge, it would seem, ourselves but characters, and we mature not when we cancel the show to escape the cinema into the noonday sun, but when we dwell in its day night long enough to project a show that sublimates our longings for beauty and love. Can our creative powers survive the real traumata of an indifferent world while still representing them as beautiful and the world as lovable? To do so, we must recognize the necessity of our dreams, our inescapable role as their artists, and our contradictory identity as monsters. Thank you. Thank you.